Hi, this is Robin Sampson with BibleJournalLove.com and HeartOfWisdom.com. Welcome. It is lovely to have you here. Today we're going to go over the introduction to the Bible journaling through 12 Bible eras. This is part one of three part videos that you're going to be watching in this introduction. First, we're going to start with the why. Start with the why is the name of a best-selling book that's out right now, and uh, you can see the video online if you want to go to YouTube. It's called Start with the Why by Simon. You'll see it. His name is Simon. And the second video will be on a Bible overview. We'll have Bible 101. How do we get it? Is it true? Uh, how do we know? And how it's organized. And then the third video will be a course overview what we're going to be studying and why I'm using the steps that I'm using and how it's going to help you. So first we're going to start this video with three sections. Why, relationship, and obstacles. Why do we Bible journal? Well I asked this on the uh, Bible Journal Love Facebook group and I was just tickled with the answers I got. I was I told a friend of mine I said you know if, if the, all these ladies want a Bible journal just because they want to learn crafts I'm gonna have to revert to my sneaky days when I used to sneak spinach into muffins for my toddlers but I don't have to do that because the ladies who answered the Bible journal poll all were very uh, they had good answers let me read a couple of them to you one lady said, I want to know God more and get a better view of his attributes. Beautiful. God's attributes and knowing them helps you get a good understanding of who God is. And a lot of people have a wrong view of God. And studying his attributes is an excellent way. And we're going to be looking at all that through the uh, Bible errors. Someone else said, getting a better understanding of the Bible, to learn the Bible contextually, to learn, understand, and grow as a Christian. So you can see that we have some seekers in our group, some ladies that are really ready to get to know God better, to have a closer relationship with Him. I like to ask people to imagine, and I'm going to ask you to imagine something with me. But first, I have a confession to make. I have a secret fantasy. It's about laundry. I have been doing laundry for 50 years. <laughs> Literally 50 years. I've had nine children and I've never seen the bottom of my laundry basket in 40 years, maybe twice. Uh, I just do a lot of laundry. So my fantasy is to have Jane Jetson's laundry room. She put in the laundry, it went in the machine, washed, dried, folded, ironed, starched, came out completely ready to go. What a great fantasy is that? And now I want to ask you to have a fantasy, have a, a little imagination with me. I want you to imagine that an angel comes to your door, knocks on the door and you answer it, and you go and the, the angel says, you have been chosen by God to come and stay with him a couple hours every day or an hour every day. Can you imagine? Try to imagine it. Just try to imagine. And, and the angel is driving this little Jetson's hot rod. So you get in the hot rod and you whoosh off to heaven. And sure enough, you get to heaven to this glorious city and with streets of gold. And you enter into the throne room of God. And while you're there, you sit at his feet, and you know, he's very excited to see you because he is especially fond of you. And then while you're there, he tells you these stories, amazing stories of 6,000 years of different things that he's done throughout history to bring man into his presence so that he could join man with him again in a relationship. And you listen, and you ask questions, and you listen some more. Then it's time to go, but you're so excited because you feel so special. And the next day, the angel comes again. Knock, knock. You get into the little Jetson machine and whoosh off. Well, you know where I'm going with this. 
We all have time every day to sit with the creator of the universe. So we're not sitting with a book. We're sitting with God, the creator of the universe. He speaks to us through his word, and we speak to him through prayer. And you have the time to do this every single day. And when God gave the people manna in the desert when they were wandering, that was part of the picture. To, Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word of the mouth of God. We need his word. We wake up to fault every single day in our flesh, in a sin nature flesh. And we need God's word to transform us and to change us. And I don't know about you, but I need it every single day. So now we're going to talk about relationship. What is a relationship with God? We know that you want one. Well, you know what? God is in you. His spirit is in you. Can't get much closer than that. But you want to know him better. And the way you do that is Bible time, prayer, and attitude. And, and that's what we're talking about today. Our relationship with God involves trust, communication, faith, devotion. He wants us to be in union with him. Agreement, reverence, he wants to work through us. His love comes into us and pours out to other people. When you see that grandma looking at that grandchild with the most she just falls in love with this child. That means that God put love in her through to that baby. So we connect with God through prayer. And then once we realize that we're adopted by him and that we're part of his family, we are princesses. Our father God is king, king of the universe. And a when you hear the phrase kingdom of heaven, which we hear a lot in the Bible, there's a huge amount written about the kingdom of heaven. Well, that's a Hebrew idiom. It just means, uh, you've heard it said, uh, heaven help me or God help me. It's just another way because they didn't use God's name. And the kingdom of heaven is God's kingdom. And it's here now. It's not something that we go do when we die. It's here and now. There's a heaven up there, but the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We live in it every day as princesses because we're part of God's family and our part is also to be yielded to him he's the potter and we're the clay and he transforms us from the inside out when we let him dying to that flesh we focus on him and let him shake up shape us I have some problems yielding sometimes I have to uh, admit that I I confess uh, I don't yield very well I am in a hurry, and God wants me to slow down, and I forget that a lot, <laughs> and he reminds me again, and I confess it and, and repent and get back with the program because I can't do it on my own. I have to do it with him, allow him to work through me, and when I do that, then I'm in union with him and all's right with the world, but when I get out, off step and go into my own sinful nature again, everything's a mess. Another thing you need to know is we have to battle for this relationship. You know, God tells us in the New Testament to put on the armor. And that armor, every single piece of it has to do with the word, even faith, because faith is what gets us into the word and recognizes that God is God. But the sword of the Spirit is symbolic of the word of God. And not only do we need the sword of the Spirit to combat the enemy, we need the sword of the Spirit to combat this flesh, to bring it down, to die to flesh so we can rise up through God. We, we're born with this flesh and we have to live with it until the day we die. And thank God we can get rid of it then and then we can go up and spend time with him in our spiritual bodies. So the belt of truth, the feet of peace, the breastplate of righteousness, righteousness is part of the word too, are all part of the word, the helmet of salvation. Now here's when we're going to talk about the problems, the obstacles. Busyness, busyness is huge. You know it and I know it. We live in this microwave generation. Everything's boom, boom, boom. The kids have all kinds of lessons to go to. Church is open six times a week and we're committed all over the place and just too busy sometimes to stop and open the word. 
Then false perceptions, lies that I'm going to explain, self-deceptions, more lies, and attitude again. This lady is very busy. I had to take out uh, something out of her hand to put the Bible in her hand because I wanted you to have a visual a picture of her working and looking at all the things that she has to do, her list to do, her cooking, her cleaning, and the Bible is the most important thing. And if we can do that every day, you know, Jesus got up a great while before the day and went to his Father in prayer. How much more so do we need to? So if we can get up early and spend some time with our Father, copying some verses, because if you copy a verse, you'll remember it 11 times more. Just time in his word. And you know what? We live in a time when more than ever in history, the Bible is available to us. When we're standing in line at the checkout counter, we can be looking at the Bible on our smartphone. When we're in the car, we can use the Bluetooth to listen to the word on the radio. When we're going to bed, we can turn on Alexa or Echo, whatever you call it, and listen to the Bible. When we're, walk we're in the kitchen, we can take our laptop or our iPad in there and listen to the Bible. This is, there's no excuses anymore. We have the Word with us all the time. The, first the second obstacle is lies. Most Americans view God as a Greco-Roman God, authoritarian God. This was from uh, New York, uh, New York, I'm sorry, USA Today Religion Survey. And out of 91% that said they believed in God, um, they all said that they believed in God in one of these four things. And the first one was authoritarian. And that's just really sad because they believe that not only is he mean, but he's waiting with a thunderbolt for to get us for doing something. And that's just such a bad view of God. And I had the same view. I didn't realize it until I thought about it. Um, and I realized I was on a treadmill, always trying to earn his love. And it took me a, a lot of years to overcome that. And I've got some resources in the library if you have that problem too. So what we need is a better view of God, and I'm going to tell you about that in a minute. But another obstacle that we have is lies from Satan. He whispers to us constantly, we're not good enough, we're not spiritual enough, we're not smart enough, we're not kind enough, we're not in church enough, we're not reading our Bible enough. And let me just tell you right now, I don't want you to read the Bible if you're just reading it because you have to. I want you to read it because you love the writer. I want you to read it because you want to know him better. Because that's when it's going to be meaningful to you. So anyway, Satan tells us these lies. And when he tells us these lies, we need to learn to renew our mind. Guess what the answer to that is? Time in the Word. When we're in the Word, we saturate and immerse our mind. I'll give you an example of um, how Satan uses some things. Uh, there's a television show. There was a television show that I liked and eventually they put in a gay character and were showing some things and I had to stop watching it because it was just disgusting. Well, you know what? If you keep watching something like that, that the world accepts people not being married and things like that, and I'm not being legalistic. I'm not going to tell you what to watch on TV. But what he does was he keeps indoctrinating you that it's okay. It's okay. Gay is okay. Sex before marriage is okay. And before you know it, you have a distorted view of the way God wants you to live because you have more TV than you do the Bible. So what you do when you read the Bible is you're fixing your mind, you're renewing your mind to put it on, focused on things above, the things that he asks us to be, and living the way he tells us to live. Because it's not that if you don't live that way, he's going to get you with this lightning bolt. He gave you the instructions just the way you instruct your children because he loves us and he wants us to have a good life, a good fulfilling life. And you can't do that if you're, if you're breaking his laws because all of his laws have consequences when you break them. It's just that simple. There's a consequence to gravity and there's a consequence to breaking God's laws. This is what I can't wait to share you, with you what the real God is. Our God 
and this is what I tell my children, our God has the character of the prodigal son's father. Let me tell you the story just in case you don't know it. I'll, I'll succinct it real, real short. There was a man who was entitled, spoiled, and rotten, and he went to his father, and he said, Father, I don't want to wait for you to die for your inheritance. I want it now. And his father reluctantly gave it to him. I'm not sure why. This is a Jewish family, and this was very, very wrong thing to do. So anyway, he, do, he does what all entitlement children do. He goes out and parties and gets women and gets drunk and spends all of his money. Before long, he has no more money. He's, all of his friends leave him. And he ends up hungry. And he goes to a farm where there's pigs. And now this is a Jewish boy. They're not even allowed to be around pigs because they were for trash only. They are, were not, never considered food. But he saw what the pigs were eating. And it looked appetizing to him because he was hungry. So there he sits at the pig pen, getting the farmer to let him eat some of the pig food or, or swapping work for food. And he thinks, my father's servants eat better than this. I can at least go home and eat better than this. And he goes home. Now, however long it took him to get home, when he gets to the driveway, to the, ro the road going down to the path to his house, his father is looking for him. He's waiting and looking down the road, and he sees him. And when he sees him, he sprints, he flies up that driveway, and he grabs his son, and he hugs, and he kisses him. And the son hasn't even said a word yet. He's loving and forgiving. The son hasn't even said he was sorry yet. And the father's hugging him and kissing him. He's, have a party. Kill the fatted calf. My son was lost and he's home. My son is home. He was thrilled. That's our father. God has wrath, but not the kind of wrath with a lightning bolt out to get people. Our God's wrath is against sin and against things that separate us from him. He, want, he gets mad at anything that takes us away from him because he loves us more than we could even imagine loving our own children. That's how much he loves us. So that's the father. And I tell my children, if you don't ever remember anything else I've told you the whole time growing up about the Bible, I want you to remember one thing. There is nothing you can do, nothing, to make God love you more or less. I have a passion for people to know this because I didn't believe it. I didn't know it myself. For many, many, many years, I walked some religion walk of legalism and uh, being free from it and having a real relationship with God is the best thing that's ever happened to me. And it put me on the right path of a fulfilling life, a happy life, a joyful life. I've had problems. I still have problems, but I have my father here to comfort me during those problems. And I know if he allowed something that there was a reason for it. And I can walk with him, walk in union with him, and be in agreement with him every day. I can wake up every morning and go, what would you have me do today? What would you have me say? Who would you have me talk to? Lead me and guide me and teach me. That's what it's all about. So I've put some resources in the resource section that will help you. There's some books by Wayne Jacobson, Baxter Kruger, and C.S. Lewis. And if you have any problems in these areas, um, the Healing the Wounded Heart, that was from uh, if you have sexual abuse in your past. Because when you have broken and damaged things that don't get fixed, they rain on your parade, on your spiritual parade later on. And you want to get those things out of the way and fix your life by renewing your mind, walking with Him, and that's the path you need to take. You just keep on keeping on. So we've covered, we start with a why. We want a Bible journal because we want a relationship with God. A relationship with God is the most fulfilling thing that anyone can have here on earth. And there's obstacles, our busyness, and lies. And I've covered all that. And tomorrow, or later on, I'm sorry, the next video, part two, is going to be a Bible overview.
We're going to look at what the Bible is about, uh, where it came from, how do we know it's true, and all the different divisions. Because It's basically Bible 101 for those that aren't used to it. And then I go into how to answer. Maybe you, you don't think that you need the next video because you already know how many books are in the Bible, etc., etc. But do you know this? If somebody came and asked you, how do you know the Bible's real? Do you know what you would say? Do you have an answer for that? If you don't, see the next video because I'm going to give you the answers to give to them and tell you where to get a whole lot more. And then the third part, we're going to go over the course overview. And we'll go into a lot of detail about what we're going to be covering from, for the next few weeks. So that's it for now. I am praying for each and every one of you. Please pray for me. And I will see you in the Facebook group. Bye-bye.